You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. guys, super excited to dive into this week's episode. We are going to be speaking with the founder of OnTrajectory.com. Now, I should say that if you guys have listened to like kind of the tools that I have used, you'll notice that OnTrajectory wasn't one of the ones that I had personally taken advantage of, had personally relied on, but... I'm always open to new information and throughout the community, I kept seeing this particular tool pop up on people whose opinion I deeply respected and they were just raving about it. They were over the moon at it. And uh, while Brad basically still uses just a pen and a piece of paper, (laughs) for those of us that like to live in a digital world, apparently like this is one of the most robust financial planning calculators that has a consumer facing front, has something that you will actually be able to intuitively understand and adapt to your specific situation. I wanted to find out a little bit more and I was thrilled to see how embedded in the FI community Tyson, who's our guest today, actually is. He's got a phenomenal story. Can't wait to share it with you. And to help me with this, I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan, I'm doing quite well. And yeah, you're right. Tyson is certainly embedded in the FI community. We first learned about him from Deanna, Miss Phiology, who basically said, when I first did my FI projections, I was fairly confident in the numbers. However, once I started using On Trajectory, my confidence has skyrocketed. And that just got my attention. And then I saw J.D. Roth did a review of it. Jillian from Montana Money Ventures loves it. And not to mention, Tyson has a fantastic story going way back to entrepreneurial adventures as a child to a career in the army and et cetera, et cetera. So this should be really, really fascinating. Tyson, with that, welcome to the podcast. Uh, thanks, guys. I uh, I have to admit, I'm a little bit starry-eyed being here. I'm, I'm just thrilled to be chatting with you two. Uh, I'm a big fan of the show. So uh, if I get nervous, you'll know why. <laughs> I am genuinely curious. How did you hear about the show? Well, I mean, apart from winning multiple awards at FinCon and being all over the uh, interwebs, you know, it's just part of the fabric of the community, really. Well, let's go back a little bit further. You have been in the financial independence community for a while. When did you start using that language? When did you realize that there were a community of people out there that were thinking the same way that you were thinking? That's a tough question to answer because I was doing it and, you know, a lot of people tell the same kind of story. I was doing it on my own. It's it's the way it made sense to me. I mean, I, I couldn't sleep at night if I didn't have some sort of plan to know that there was a time when I could just stand up and walk off my job and not have to worry about where I was going to get my next meal. Why, can I, guess I, can I, I interrupt yeah, my first question? Sure. Ask another question. <laughs> why, why do you think that is? Because so many people don't think that way, right? Until relatively recently, we used to all think we were anomalies. Do you have any insight as to why you were always mentally framed that way? Honestly, I think it's because I grew up in a very affluent area without being very affluent. And I was always kind of comparing myself, I think, to other children. And I always felt like they had things that I had no chance to have. And if I was going to achieve it, I needed to do it on my own. And I just felt I needed a plan to get there. That's interesting, though. If you grew up in this affluent area, the possible options are, hey, you look at them and you want to keep up with the Joneses and you're just buying expensive things, right? Instead of saving money which is the path to FI. Like, do you recollect a time where, where you wanted to keep up with them and, and you spent more than you probably should have or could afford? Absolutely. Yeah. I think the first time I started earning any money at all, and, and I don't mean any money, I mean real money, because I, I started working, which I'm sure we'll get into it, in my preteens. And I worked all through junior high and high school. Uh, but when I graduated high school, I eventually ended up in the army and started making some really decent money. At that precise time, when I started making decent money, I went into the biggest debt of my life because of just what you said. I finally had the vehicles to kind of show off a little bit. And I did. But it turned out that that feeling was really not very fun, trying to pay down credit cards or 
being completely upside down on your life, for me, that was extremely stressful. It's funny how I got out of that hole, but it was only because Saddam Hussein invaded Iraq that I was able to get out of my financial debt. Wow. That's a uh, silver lining, right? <laughs> I know. That was not the awakening that I was expecting. <laughs> okay. So it sounds like at this particular point in time, you are, can I say off trajectory, right? Maybe even you would even say drifting. Uh, what age were you at this particular point in time? I was 19 or 20. What does it look like to correct course? And when you did that, what was your financial picture? Well, from the time that I started flight school, so I was a helicopter pilot. When I started flight school, they put you on a decent salary and uh, started opening up all these store credit cards and other credit cards. And I bought a new car and et cetera, et cetera. And as I said, it was it started to become a struggle. I had thought about trying to get everything sorted and, and probably had put some mental energy toward it. But as I said, when, when I went away in, into Iraq and uh, was stuck in a combat zone with literally, quite literally, nothing to spend my money on, and I was earning more money because I was in a combat zone, uh, the money just built up. When I got out, I said, you know, no more of this, this struggling. I paid off every single credit card. I got myself, I uh, started investing. I didn't invest very wisely, but I didn't know that much at the time. And uh, that sense of safety and security that was created knowing that I had a path that was on an upward trajectory instead of the downward trajectory that I had been on, having that sense of freedom and wellness was an emotional moment for me. And I never wanted to, uh, to lose that again. Tessin, I want to ask about that time when you're 19 and you are trying to keep up with the Joneses. As I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you're 19, you're in flight school. I always assumed that pilots, uh, helicopter and airplane pilots in the military were officers, but that would suggest like post-college. But based on the timeline, I'm assuming that I'm wrong there, right? <laughs> You're almost wrong, but you're kind of right. <laughs> <laughs> I strive to be almost wrong, minimum. <laughs> uh, so uh, there was a special program. So I graduated high school in 1986. And uh, at that time, they had something called high school to flight school. Since the Vietnam War, the Army has been churning out something like 30 to 60 new helicopter pilots every two weeks. The Army has more aircraft than you know all the other uh, services put together. So they need a lot of a lot of pilots. The rank that I went into was called a warrant officer. And so a warrant officer does not have the same college requirements as a regular officer. A regular officer is lieutenant, captain, you know, major colonel. Uh, so a warrant officer does not have the college requirements, although it is usually needed. But with this special program, it wasn't. But the great part is they pay the same as a regular officer, and you don't have to manage people. So, you know, in the military, officers are managers and the non-officers are the doers. So you have regular officers that are pilots, but they don't get to fly very much. The warrant officer is a dedicated technical rank that only flies and has no people responsibility. So it makes a little bit more sense to let people in even when they're only 18 or 19 years old and begin training uh, for that program because you're looking for someone that's just highly technical and highly uh, focused on a particular skill. So it's a warrant officer was the rank, uh, paid nearly the same as a regular officer, but with no, again, no management. Cool. Well, thank you for illuminating me on that. That's really neat information. So, right, you're 19 years old, you have no student loan debt because you didn't go to college. You're getting paid the same as like an 01. And then I'm assuming you just start spending it like it's, <laughs> it's going out of style. Like talk me through that, like the, the psychology of this. So, yeah, I mean, that's basically it. N not only spending it as fast as I could make it, but spending it faster than I could make it because I started to all those things that I had lusted over as a kid. I don't want to make it sound like I was dirt poor, but you know, we were definitely lower middle class in an upper class part of the state of Maryland. You know, I'd worked all through high school to save up enough money to buy my own car, paid my own car insurance, um, gas and stuff like that, needed the car to get to my other jobs and uh, that sort of thing. So when I started in the military and was making this money, once you get past a certain point in flight school, they let you out on the weekends. So they don't in the beginning, but then they do eventually. And so I would go out on the weekends and I would just go to the mall and I would buy clothes and cologne. <laughs> I mean, things, you know, that I just had never been able to spend money on before cars and 
I felt like, you know, here I am. I look at me. I'm in flight school and I'm 19 years old. And, and, and well, to be honest, it was a great, had a great time. Yeah. Uh, look at this then, electronic tie organizer that I bought. It was a great deal. Oh, you don't wear dress shirts. Well, oh, I had, I bought, <laughs> I bought a video recorder, you know, full size VHS video recorder. I bought, I mean, everything, everything that I wanted, I went out and bought it. I'm, you know, this is really a retroactive look back, but I'm curious because I think it adds some insight here at the low point of this consumption spree that you were on. Do you have any idea how much consumer debt you actually had that you were cleaning up? We got to think about the times. So this is, we're talking about 1988-ish, maybe 89, into 89. I mean, it was in the thousands, but it wasn't the tens of thousands that people have today. Okay. But you do have a $15,000 car that you literally can't drive while you're deployed, just, just to clarify, <laughs> that you're making payments on. <laughs> oh, oh, definitely. Oh, that definitely happened. Yes. Okay. Not only that, I bought a new car while I was deployed. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course. <laughs> <laughs> You know, my familiarity with your story is that uh, you did not end up doing 20 in the military. And uh, I guess I'm a little bit curious about that pivot out and what you ended up doing next. Right. So after the Gulf War, I, again, this is 1992. So a lot of listeners might not have that long of a memory span, but we had committed all these thousands, hundreds of thousands of soldiers to the first Gulf War. And when it was over, they were looking for volunteers to get out. I raised my hand. They said, okay, you're out in a few months. Uh, so I'd only done four years, but I still got the full GI Bill and I still had my debt paid off. And I, I actually had some money in the bank by the end of it. Awesome. So full GI Bill and you are going back to college, I guess now as the founder of an IT company, you decide to go get a uh, IT degree, right? <laughs> that would make sense. No, <laughs> no, I, uh, I went through my artistic phase. So I first went back, I wanted to be a writer. I went back and was a English major with a concentration in writing. I got to just before graduation, I had literally one semester left and I was taking an in introduction to philosophy course. And uh, on the night of the final, I'm riding up in the elevator to the final exam and the professor gets in. And he says, uh, I hope you haven't chosen a major yet, because I think you would be a great philosophy major. Well, I was just Most so- Most expensive elevator ride ever. <laughs> <laughs> I was so, I felt so flattered that the he was the chair of the department, that he would say this to me. I thought, wow, I'm going to have to do something about that. So I looked into actually minoring in philosophy. Turns out it was only about I think six more credits for a double major. So I ended up spending another year in college, basically studying just philosophy for every semester until I graduated. But then, yeah, so I, I added on another year, uh, had the double degree. Tyson, we talk a lot about the value of college. And I think a lot of us kind of have this somewhat myopic view that it has to be a major that you're going to instantly turn into a job. But I'm guessing that wasn't the case with your double major. I'd love to hear where you went from there almost immediately, but also maybe your thoughts more generally on college and the value of a liberal arts degree. I went to college with the mindset that I was going to learn about things that interested me. I disappointed several people in my family by making that decision. But, you know, I had just come out of a war and four years in the military and a pilot. So I knew I had something in my back pocket and I felt like I just really wanted to do that for myself. Now, looking back on it, did I make the wrong decision? Absolutely not. I value the skills that I learned in my liberal arts time, the thinking and the writing and the clarity of argumentation and all of those great things. And plus I fed my brain that all, all the nourishment that it wanted and do not feel I made the wrong decision. Now, the flip side of that is when I graduated, I really had genuinely zero job prospects. And in fact, the first thing I did was try to do some teaching ended up doing a long-term substitute position for an English class, a seventh grade English class. And I tell you about the first week into that experience, I wanted to just sit and cry in the corner. It was just terrible. I, I didn't know how to teach and that was clear. And that was a super bad decision. I love that you said, like, basically you were feeding your brain, you know, after this post-war period of time, this degree that you picked had so much more value for you than, than frankly, just what came away on your final degree. 
what I wanted to mention just for our audience is that you were able to do this without going into student loan debt because you had the GI Bill. And so while I suspect that for our audience, it's going to be less useful to pick your knowledge on the GI Bill now, just because this is back in, I guess, what, the 90s, we went in depth into how the GI Bill works currently with a military dollar, episode 95 of our podcast. I have a friend that just recently got to the Air Force. I was begging them, pleading with them, listen to this episode because it's such a great gateway for all the types of information that you need to know when you take that path. And it's an incredible path to financial independence. And Tyson, I obviously want to keep going with your story. You know, we, we're at this point, this inflection point where the seventh graders and and it's just not working right. But I kind of want to get a sense of, of your financial picture at that point. You had this awakening at some point during your four years in the army. At the beginning, you're literally buying cars. I don't know how you test drove it from Iraq, honestly, and, and had it delivered in the US, but like, you know, you're spending money, right? I mean, you're spending more money than you have, but then you have that awakening. I'd love to hear like where you move forward financially with that and kind of how that ties into maybe the opportunity cost of what I have to assume is, I think you said you went to an extra year of college. So maybe four or five years thereabouts. Talk me through where you are financially post awakening. Right. During college, I, I lived extremely frugally. I lived in my parents' basement for most of the time. And uh, as I said, I, I always managed to save not a lot, very, very frequently, just a little bit. But I think for a lot of people, that's the key. Save just a little bit over time. But once I finished college and now I had no job prospects and Again, I didn't have a, any loans, but I didn't have any real pathway either. What I ended up doing was coming back to something that I had loved as a child. I was born right on the edge of the personal computing awakening. And in my enthusiasm, I had taught myself to program and had remained pretty technical and, and computer savvy over the years. When I realized that teaching English was a non-starter in public schools, I ended up teaching computer courses. And these computer courses allowed me to, A, teach adults, which is a much easier job, and to rekindle all of my technical background that I had and then build upon it. So I'm teaching people. But as I'm teaching them, I'm taking classes at the place where I teach. And then when I would learn a new skill, they would then sign me up to start teaching it to our students. So it was this cycle where I was increasingly becoming more and more technical than I already had been, and then immediately teaching that skill. And, and then you've probably heard before, you, you know, you can only truly understand something if you know it well enough to teach it. And I believe that that's really true. And it accelerated uh, mock speed, my ability to become very technical very quickly. And within literally within a year or about 18 months, I got a job as a programmer, architect. I ended up being a project manager and spent the next 25 years in IT. Okay. I have so many, so much I have to hop in here. So to clarify, you got accepted or you went to a college and you leveraged your current degree, which is English and liberal arts to be a teacher there, but you specifically were teaching some level of technical knowledge. I don't know if that's programming or something else, but you're not teaching what your degree is in it. First of all, am I, am I clear on that? You, well, I, I started to. So I did a long-term substitute position in English, but the kids killed me. I, it, was, it was just a terrible experience. And so I did that teaching for a while, and then I parlayed that teaching experience and my technical background into getting hired at a New Horizons. It's a computer learning center. And then you're able to then, because you did that, able to take their additional classes for free because you're working there. And then as you take the classes, you're then immediately able to add that to your stack and then teach that to the, essentially the next year. That's exactly right. That's really amazing. Like, is that replicable? I mean, think about that now. Is it, Have you ever considered like what a valuable model that is? I've always heard the phrase, and I believe it personally, the best way to learn something is to teach it. Um, it just forces you to make everything more concise to make sure that what you think you read on paper, you know, you can actually communicate that out. You have to have it locked down. I love that. Do you think that there's an actual viable strategy there for someone that wants to pivot out of maybe a degree that they don't see a huge runway on? Well, I can speak from my experience in the 90s. Now, the landscape might be different, but what I'll tell you is those kind of learning centers do still exist. And the threshold, obviously, the threshold for entry was not real high to teach there because they took me. And it should be. 
Now, I will say that when I took the courses internally, it wasn't exactly for free. What they would do is they would put down in a, in a little ledger like how much that course was worth, and then they would tack that on as almost like an indentured servitude. I'd have to stay and teach a certain number of times before that debt was paid off. And I actually messed up a little bit. I quit because I found a, a much more technical job as a network administrator. And when I gave my two weeks notice, they said, okay, here's your bill. And so they gave me a $6,000 bill. Luckily, I went back to my prospective hire and said, hey, uh, can you cover this for me? And they were nice enough to give me that as a, bo- a hiring bonus. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I guess you're right. The landscape probably has changed, especially you have kids who are growing up as digital natives. So while you probably wouldn't necessarily be able to replicate that right now, I'm sure there are other ways where you can get a foot in the door. Even I'm thinking something like teaching English abroad, the barrier to entry is low. Like if you're willing to just get in there and do something that's slightly outside of your comfort zone, right? For many people teaching is outside their comfort zone, but you never know when you're going to enjoy it. So obviously you had this substitute teaching job. Was there any level of imposter syndrome when you walked into that first job, that first class teaching technology in essence, and you don't know all that much more than the people you were teaching in the grand cosmic scheme of things, right? Like if they went to the next class, you'd be there sitting there taking the course. Was there any of that? Or was this just like, head down, like, I'm going to learn as many skills as I possibly can and just use this as a stepping stone. It is absolutely the first. I was the biggest imposter. Uh, Let me tell you this story. I was teaching Microsoft Exchange Server, which is a pretty complicated application. It's an, you know, email server. I would literally go to lunch. People would say, hey, you want to grab some lunch? Oh, no, I need to uh, make a few phone calls. I would grab a sandwich, get in my car, drive my car off the parking lot and study for the next lecture, which was occurring in an hour because I, I just did not know the material well enough. I knew enough to pass the exam and that's all my employer cared about. But that was really a struggle. And I felt I felt bad for the people that I was teaching until I realized, you know, a lot of them were there because they didn't want to and their their employers were paying them to be there. And so I would basically teach them what was on the test because I knew what was on the test. I had just taken the test a couple of weeks before. And in many cases, they were thankful for that because that's that's all they cared about as well. But I definitely did. I was a walking imposter for years. You were as close to an actual imposter as I can imagine. But what's amazing about that is um, you're, you know, there are actually websites out there that uh, rate professors. And if you go and look at your reviews as a teacher, they're actually shockingly good. So um, just your ability to communicate, I'm sure while in that first year is probably a little rough around the edges. Certainly your craft was honed throughout the years. And I think all of us start as an imposter at some point and have to develop the skill set. So the fact that you were at least willing to lean into it and get better over time really says a lot about you. Now, I'm curious, this company that you started working for, uh, my understanding is you spent basically the last 20 years working with that same company. I'm curious, as that ties to your path to financial independence, if you look back and you're giving advice to younger Tyson, what levers, what actions did you take to really allow yourself to be having the conversation that we're having today? Well, so this gets back to something I think we touched on earlier in the conversation, whereas I just had this natural instinct. So once I had, I did my silly stuff in the military and, and got into debt and got out of debt, I had this natural instinct to wanting a curve into my future that that was outpacing me. I should say outpacing traditional retirement. Let's put it that way. And so that curve, I was always watching it, you know, with spreadsheets or maybe I I built a little calculator or something like that. I just had this natural affinity for doing things like maxing out your 401k or taking advantage of flexible spending or or, uh, HSA accounts. So I took every opportunity for those sorts of savings I took. I always made sure that I was saving something, some extra juice on top. I didn't necessarily quantify it as in some of the more aggressive terms that the FI community uses today, because again, there was no community. There, well, there may have been a community, but there was no, no community that, that I was aware of. The internet was just becoming a thing. So we're talking about early 2000s. So the things that I was doing, matching the 401k, maxing out the 401k, those sort of came naturally to me. When I did become aware of the community and would often read articles, I would think to myself, how can someone not take 
matching money. That's just absurd. Uh, but it's interesting that people do have to be reminded to do that. Mm. And so along the way on this path, you at some point, actually within the last like five or so years, you started really putting a lot of effort into on trajectory, which is you're, you're the founder of this company and this software and these calculators, like they're very robust. How did, where did this idea come from? And yeah, w- what was the spark for that? So the spark was I was sitting in my office working on, I don't, I don't even know what I worked from home a lot. And my wife walked in. Now we were living at the time we were living in downtown Baltimore in little Italy. We had a one-year-old child, a less than one-year-old, so she was a baby, and we you know, had one car, and we would walk most places and didn't really drive much, and, had, and I could walk to work, and I would bicycle places, and it was you know, just sort of this inner city, normal kind of uh, existence. She walked into my office and said, honey, I've got great news. I'm pregnant. And I said, oh, that's great. And I'm thinking to myself, Okay, that means a second child. How does that change the numbers? (laughs) Yeah, that means, okay, now it's another 529. You wish that you could give yourself credit for like five minutes of just pure joy, but in like 30 (laughs) seconds, you said, how does that change the numbers? (laughs) And, And I even had, I had an FI date in my head. And my first thought was, Oh, well, that's going to move. And, uh, and there was no, and there was no easy way to do the math. And that was the biggest thing was, you know, I was like, okay, do I contribute less to the 401k and more to the 529 or I'm um, going to need a bigger house? How much house do I buy as cheap a house as I can get away with? Or do I buy the most house and let the, you know, the increase in property value take a bigger chunk? You know, so there was just all of these many, many variables. While I did have a robust spreadsheet, it wasn't, as robust as I wanted. So it probably uh, didn't look very pretty either. (laughs) No. And it was not very reusable, right? It was, you know, very manual. And uh, I just got it in my head that if I wanted to figure this out, I had been doing software engineering at this point for, you know, between 15 and 20 years. And, uh, I built basically a prototype of on trajectory. I built it in, in Excel for the first version and just built a tool where you could, uh, and I should, let me preempt this as well. I had spent hundreds and hundreds of hours looking at all the free tools out on the internet and even some of the uh, professional planning tools and nothing satisfied me. Uh, You know, I just could not imagine trying to do what I could already do in a spreadsheet, trying to do with those tools. It was impossible. And so that I just got tired of somebody else waiting for someone else to build it. So this truly was for the Phi community, right? I mean, in essence, it was for you, a member of the Phi community, but you're thinking with Phi principles when you created this, right? That's exactly right. I, I So everything that you, once you guys experience on trajectory, you're going to see everything is built for a regular consumer, regular person, just to find out the answer to that question. When you know, what does the arc of my financial life look like? If I add this complexity in and I do this other stuff, when can I be done? Or, you know, what, what are the options that I have? And that's built just to answer that question. So, you know, how one question trickles down into like a cascade, a never ending stream of questions. What was that like for you? Like what questions have you started answering since that initial inflection point? So we're very responsive to our community and we actually, we do an annual survey. We say, Hey, you know, it's been a great year. Here's what we did last year. What do you guys want to see next year? And the things that have really changed is that people, <laughs> people, this might be a surprise. People are inherently lazy, right? They don't want to key in a bunch of data. They want things to be as automated as possible. So while to a large part, the big pieces of on trajectory have remained pretty consistent over the past you know, four years. What people are looking for is automated ways to, you know, what if I change this? What is the Monte Carlo and historical analysis change? How does it, or to take the question backwards, you tell me what I need to save or what I need or what extra I can spend. I actually have people asking me, Hey, I've uh, configured my trajectory and my Monte Carlo is up to a hundred percent. And, uh, is there a way on trajectory can tell me how much more I can spend so that I don't have to leave anything to my kids. So we're building pieces and parts into the tool that automate a lot of these things. I have used a bunch of the free tools that are out there and maybe I've tried, dabbled with a couple of the paid. I'm, I'm curious in your mind where this fits. What What is it trying to be? What does it really excel at? And, and your answer could be, well, everything. And for example, for me personally, I use Mint and or YNAB. Uh, to handle my day-to-day, week-to-week expenses, to set up my budget uh, for my investments, for my net worth calculations. I use personal capital. 
uh, and even my future value calculations. You know, where does this fit into that spectrum? So we see ourselves as complementary to Mint and YNAB and a direct competitor to personal capital. And I don't mean direct competitor from a business model. I mean, from a tooling perspective. Now, I think, and I could be completely wrong about this, but if you take a look at the way they've implemented certain characteristics in their retirement planning tool, there are striking similarities to the way on trajectory works. And it's also curious that they came out about two years after we did our first beta release. So, you know, take that for what it is, but there are a lot of pieces and parts that, that are similar. Now, where we still have an edge is that uh, their tool is, there's some big pieces. So you can say like, oh, I want to plan for maybe a, a large vacation in my future or something like that. You can do that. With, with On Trajectory, you can do like things like, um, oh, I want to take a thousand dollar per year vacation for the next five years. And I want to have a big treat and do like a big $5,000 tour of Europe. And then I want to drop back and not take a vacation for a few years. And then I want to do something else later on in life. And so you can model that expense stream across all those different periods of your life with highly different characteristics. And it's not just your vacation expense stream. It's your car and your, your house and you know, everything else that is in your life. At the same time that we make things easy, we try to help educate people, you know, that there are mortgages have different characteristics than other kind of expense streams. And I don't want to get too in the weeds here, guys, but things like um, a car payment or a mortgage, since it's an amortized loan, it's not affected by inflation, whereas other kinds of expenses are affected by inflation. And so you can toggle that on and off for these different kinds of expenses. So the, the kind of control that you get is well, well past anything that, um, personal capital offers. But from a basic usability standpoint, that's probably the closest competitor out there. So Tyson, I want to kind of take a step back and just talk more about business building and maybe even software building. I assume if you wanted to spend 24 hours a day for the next five years, you could find little tweaks that in your perfect world you would update. But obviously at some point you're going to drive yourself crazy, right? You can't, you can't do that. You have to be I guess, either content with a minimum viable product at the beginning or iterate to get to a point where it's sufficient and it's not driving you nuts. I'd love to hear about that journey and anything you can pass along from that kind of business building perspective. Yeah, sure. So yeah, I mean, the minimum viable product thing is key. You have to, hopefully you've got a pretty good idea of what the marketplace could use. And hopefully you've got some support around you. You're not doing it completely alone. You know, other folks that are enthusiastic, but you, you do have to get something out quickly and not be afraid of criticism. I mean, that was really hard for me in the beginning because my first iteration of On Trajectory was it was so just different. perfect. It was absolutely it was, yeah. perfect. <laughs> <laughs> it was, well, the thing is, it was just so different than anything that existed. I literally thought, so I posted you know, something on Reddit you know, to their financial independence community. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to wake up tomorrow morning and I'm going to have kudos and gravitas. And <laughs> nobody ever, ever says, on Reddit before. <laughs> nobody ever says anything critical on Reddit. Never. <laughs> and I woke up to so much trash in my inbox and then I got barred because I was personal, personally promoting myself. I mean, lots of disappointments along the way, but it, it is key. So the, the minimum viable product thing is totally real. Now, beyond that, and I've heard you guys mention this on your show in different ways at different times. But what you got to do is build a product that you love. And On Trajectory only exists because I want it to exist. I want to use it. And I have questions about my future. And I check in with On Trajectory, not as often as I used to, but very often, especially when there's big shifts in the market. And because I love it so much and because I want to use it, I know that there's always going to be at least one person in my audience. So finding something that you truly love and enjoy working on is key. And then what I use as my guiding factor is, would it make it easier for me to do this thing? So I have to be honest, we do query the community quite often and we get their feedback, but I look at like whatever's in their top five, I pick the one that I want the most. And that's the one that we implement because it's fun for me to code it. It's fun for me to test it. It's fun for me to play with it. And so keeping that fun that enjoyment, that passion. You, well, let's just say it this way. You'll never be able to keep your passion about whatever product you're trying to build or lifestyle you're tr trying to pursue. You'll never keep up that passion if it's not something you, you don't really love and enjoy doing. 
Yeah, I love that. That's a great perspective. Because, yeah, I mean, you really could spend every waking second trying to make it perfect. But at some point, it's a great product. And you just can't keep really wasting time, in essence, right? So I love the polling the community and just seeing what they want, right? I'm sure there's a list of 100 things. But if you're seeing the same five over and over again, okay, that's kind of cluing you in on on at least where to start. So that's very cool. And you mentioned we a couple of times. I'd love to hear, is there a team? Like, what does your company look like? And, and how has it grown, I guess, since really you had this first itch, right? Like this was, hey, I'm Tyson. I, I need this created. And it probably starts with you at that point. But what does the company look like now? There's four key partners. And then there's other people that fluctuate in and out for smaller tasks. But it did start out with me doing that prototype in Excel. And there was a person on my team in my day job that I worked on. He, great guy, super smart. I needed a great guy who was super smart on to help me because while I was comfortable doing a lot of the front end development, I needed, I really needed someone to help me with the middle layer and the database and the security and all that stuff, because that's just as much as the front end. And uh, so I took my prototype to him and I said, look, here, look at this great thing that I build. You put in your income streams, you put in your expense streams, you put in your accounts and your investments and your savings. And then you can play with these numbers and you can change this and do that. And look, it draws automatically. It's, you can see it in real time in front of you. And he looks at me and goes, mm, okay. And I said, let's make a website. Let's do this. He's like, dude, that has to exist. I said, it doesn't. It doesn't. This does not exist. <laughs> Let me Google that and, for you. <laughs> <laughs> I said, here, here yeah, here, here's, a, here's a browser. Take a look. And here's what people get caught up, at least from the tooling perspective, is if you do it, if you write uh, retirement calculator into your browser, you are going to get literally thousands and thousands of hits, but none of them actually help you make a, a real healthy financial path into the future, which is why so many of us in the, in the five community still depend on spreadsheets because it just, you know, doesn't exist. All right. So to everyone out there, there's obviously value for having a plan for your financial life, for your financial goals. And I personally have benefited from free tools like Mint and personal capital and paid tools like YNAB, which I've talked about in the past shows. I've gotten value from various free calculators, both ones that I've made and ones that I found on the internet for free, but I would never claim that they are robust or that they talk well with each other. They are usually in different silos. So to have something that can bring all of that home into one place and have something that can grow with you, I, I do see the value. And uh, if that's intriguing to you, and if you want more information, we actually talked to Tyson about setting up a 14-day free trial. This is a full-featured free trial. You get access to all the calculators. Everything's right there. You do not need to put your credit card in in order to test it out. Just take it for a test drive. See if it's something that would add value to your life. To do that, you can just go to choosefi.com slash OT. Brad and I are doing the same thing. And uh, we will be coming back to the show in a few weeks with kind of a feedback episode where we just kind of talk to you about our takeaways, uh, how we were able to use this, what this added. So we'll kind of plan on doing that, um, you know, within the next month or so. And we'll have that on a future Friday roundup. Again, to access your free trial, just go to choosefi.com slash OT, choosefi.com slash OT. All right, now, on most shows, that would be the end of the episode. But Tyson, on this show, we would love to give you the chance to tackle the hot seat. Are you ready for this? Totally. In a world drowning in debt and rampant consumption, trapped by the chains of lifestyle inflation, these questions highlight the secrets of those who have broken free. Welcome to the Choose FI Hot Seat. All right, Tyson, question number one, your favorite blog that's not your own. I am going to have to go with Budgets Are Sexy. Okay. I would love for you to give us a little bit more detail. Obviously, we're, we're friends with Jay and, and love his content. Is there something that really stands out to you? What I love about his blog is sometimes it's kind of just at a surface level and sometimes it's deeper, but there's always like an edge of humor and irrever irreverence in there. And so I'm, I'm as entertained by his presentation as I am by the facts that he gathers and the, the interesting content that he features. Awesome. Now we do have a second question for you, and this is your favorite article of all time. Now this can be one that you wrote or someone else's. 
So the, my favorite article is actually not an article. It's a TED Talk. I hope that's okay. So I still teach uh, software engineering at Towson University, and I always make the kids build a tower out of spaghetti and place a marshmallow on top. This is based on a TED Talk, which I'm sure will provide the link, about hidden assumptions and prototyping. And it's just, I use it as a guide through many aspects of my life. Awesome. I'm just thinking out loud here because these things always drive me crazy because I just feel like crazy at the end of it. But uh, do you use the spaghetti as like went before it's been cooked? Is that like the whole hook for it? That's my guess right now. No, it's actually what screws people up is they build this structure out of dried spaghetti and they don't take into account how heavy a marshmallow is. And they generally crack and come crashing down when they try to put the marshmallow on at the end. All right. I would have lost, of course. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Question number three, your favorite life hack. So my, I guess my favorite life hack would be credit card reward points and not just reward points, just the whole concepts of credit cards in general. I mean, they're going to lend you money and then you just pay it off and then you get points. I mean, what's not to love? Plus you don't have to carry any cash in your pocket. So I, I just think credit cards, after I learned to master credit cards, then I could really start enjoying them. Yeah, you're certainly preaching to the choir here. We think that credit card rewards points are a pillar, really, of financial independence. And we actually have a free travel rewards course at chooseabuy.com slash travel for anybody out there who has not signed up yet. All right, question number four, your biggest financial mistake. My So my favorite life hack and my biggest financial mistake are the same thing. They're credit cards. Uh, <laughs> Two well, sides of the same coin. <laughs> life is like that. I, uh, I made the biggest mistakes of my life by basically signing up and then maxing out every credit card I could at, during a certain period of my life. And um, yeah, that was it. All right. Question number five advice you would give your younger self. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that my younger self, I would just say, try saving a little earlier. So I didn't really start saving any money at all until my early 20s. And not that I had a lot of money anyway that I could have saving. But I think if I had started saving earlier, I would have gotten the bug earlier. And had I gotten the bug earlier, I would have built a lot faster. And probably just by saving, I don't know, 5 or $10 a month back then, I would probably be FI already. That's awesome, man. That's certainly good advice. All right, Tyson, we have a bonus question here. So what is the purchase that you've made in, let's say, the last 12 or so months that has added the most value to your life? For this one, I'm going to have to go with something I've repurchased in the past 12 months because I, I find myself buying this particular item again and again, and that is Bluetooth headset. It has just changed my life. I have consumed more books uh, over the past few years because of Bluetooth headsets than in probably in the previous decade, uh, because I can listen as I go uh, anywhere, anytime. Literally, if I'm just walking from my office up to someplace else in my house, I'll just hit play and, and catch up with, with where I was. It has literally changed my life. Wow. That's really cool. So, okay, tell me a little bit more because I'm the guy who's walking around with the uh, the headphones attached to my phone and the phone's maybe in my pocket, but tell me why I need to go out and buy the Bluetooth headset. So for me, it's the wearable, the LG tones, the what you wear on your shoulders. So I have the re retractable earbuds. When I'm, if I, if I don't want them in my ears, I can just boop, snap them right back onto my neck. And when I want them, they're right there. Literally takes sub 10 seconds to have it in. No matter what I'm doing, listening is right there. Obviously, no cords to get tangled. And when I don't want them, I don't have to do anything with them. They're just resting on my shoulders. Now, having said that, I have been in some embarrassing situations. I've actually been at fancy dinner parties and completely forgot that I was wearing these things. It must have looked like some sort of, like I was making a technical geek statement or something when really <laughs> I wasn't at all. I just had completely forgotten because they're, they're a part of my being at this point. Uh, so just be aware of that. Better the Bluetooth headphones than like the Google glasses. I could see you doing those. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Tyson, this has been so much fun. People listening to this, they want to find out more about you and your content. What is the best way for someone to connect with you and with the On Trajectory community? Sure. So, I mean, just go to ontrajectory.com. We've got links to, you know, if you, if you want to email us, uh, my personal phone number is on the website as well. So you can, you can reach me anyway. So uh, just ontrajectory.com is the place to go, but more directly Tyson Casca at ontrajectory.com. All right. To our audience, 
If you got value from today's episode, and if you've been getting value from the episodes up to this point, just take one second and press the subscribe button on the platform you're listening to this on. It just lets the providers know you're getting value from the show and you want to be here when we produce additional content. If you want to support us in what we're doing here at ChooseFI, here are four easy ways. One, leave us an iTunes review. To do that, just go to ChooseFI.com slash iTunes. Two, use our page to sign up for travel credit cards. If you want to travel the world with miles and points instead of your hard-earned dollars, then just go to chooseify.com slash cards and get started today. Three, if you're working on the milestones of Fi, set up a personal capital account to track your progress and use our affiliate link. It's completely free and just go to chooseify.com slash PC. P is in Paul, C is in Cap. And four, and most importantly, find your friends, coworkers, and family members who might be open to this message and tell them about the podcast. Have them start with episode 100. It is a fantastic starting place. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. You've been listening to Choose FI Radio Podcast, where we help middle-class America build wealth one life hack at a time.